Welcome everybody. Um, for today's reviewer meets reviewed, we are looking at um, he hegemonies of language and their discontents. The Southwest American region since 1540. Now, this is written by Carlos, um, Carlos G. Velez Ibanez. I'm sorry about the Castilian accent. <laughs> Um, he's a Regents Professor and Founding Director Emeritus of the School of Transborder Studies at Arizona State University, as well as a lot of other roles. The book was reviewed by Anthony Grant, who's Professor of Historical Linguistics and Language at Edge Hill University. And it was reviewed in the Journal of the RAI in November 2020. I'm Martin Edwards, and I'm here to referee, sorry, chair, the discussion. I went through my own reviewer meets reviewed in 2012 with Anthony as my reviewer, and I've been preparing the second edition of my book ever since. So with that warning in mind, I will hand over to Carlos to tell us about his book. <laughs> okay, Carlos, you should be able to. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to chat uh, about this this book that uh, I created. Uh, at least started thinking about it in uh, back in 2015, and I wanted to just kind of provide you with with a bit of a uh, of the architecture of the work itself uh, at its genesis, and it really comes from a very long standing series of issues that I've already, I've always had since uh, as a child. Uh, and this particular quotation here uh, is included as, as part of the introductory material in, in the book itself. And uh, I'll read it just very, very quickly. I knew something was not quite right when the bubble nose principal yanked me out of the first grade line of children waiting to walk into their classroom in Tucson. He pulled me to his office where he rationalized his punishment by prefacing the swats I was to receive, that it was a school rule not to speak Spanish or any other tongue. I had no idea what this meant at the time. Even after three hits with a smooth ended paddle he used to impress me with, I didn't understand. I've been trying, I think, to understand this for the next many years that I have lived. And that's me, reflection and recollection on how to begin this book, August the 30th, of 2015. So I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking both about the levels of cognitive and emotional impacts uh, such a policy makes on a population, but as well the premises that uh, underlie this work as well, and my own thinking over uh, many years. And really the Conceptual gen genesis for this work really comes from uh, the ideas of Eric R. Wolf, uh, a wonderful American anthropologist who's well known worldwide. And the premise for this is that he, of course, he wrote a, a, a wonderful text uh, of uh, Europe and the people without history. And this really, the genesis for this particular, for his particular work, really comes from his 1983 speech uh, to the Faculty Senate of the City, uh, University of New York. And his, his statement was very, very, very precise. It is only when we integrate our different kinds of knowledge that the people without history emerge as actors in their own right. When we parcel them out among the several disciplines, we render them invisible. Their story, which is also our story, vanishes from sight, unquote. So for Wolf, the way in which we have segmented our knowledge into these different categories of learning and nomenclatures itself produces uh, an underlying uh, a dynamic of really reducing persons to either a statistical or a descriptive or a uh, very limited kind of narrative without tying these things, without tying their histories up at all. And the second part of his critique really comes from his, from his uh, very well thought out uh, series of, of uh, narratives. Uh, connecting really, in, 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 as others have, have done as well, the world in trade and exchange and in the creation of different modes of production. And so he says that such peoples are thought to many to have no history. So from the point of view of this work, of my own work, 
Such a process is deeply tied to removing the manner in which such hidden populations communicated with each other. And frankly, colleagues, this is what I've been trying to do for the last uh, many, many years. Conceptually, I've, I've tried to gather this material and this narrative of revelation by thinking about the notion of hegemony and, and, and how that is uh, imposed on populations. And of course, hegemony is not, is, is, has been in fact part of the, of the true and tried historical methods of empires and nations uh, uh, over others. Uh, but the, the piece that's always been missing, I think, in, in many of our discussions of hegemonic Im impacts, in fact, is what, what do people themselves uh, who are so suffered uh, do about uh, these kinds of conditions? And from my particular point of view, uh, as Foucault would suggest, there are a whole field of responses, reactions, results, and possible interventions may open up. Thus, the distributions of discontent refers to the multiple and varied and complex expressions of struggles, mirroring the processes of hegemonic distributions and are as diverse. And so this book basically is, is constructed in such a way to try to reveal as much as possible for this particular populations of what I have termed the Southwest North American region, uh, a, a chance to be revealed. Uh, and, 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 and only partially, because in fact, this is a work that uh, in, involves even a much greater effort in the very near future. One of the central themes I think that runs through at least my understandings of the rationalizations for hegemony uh, and its discontents is that there's always this kind of seeing man syndrome involved that is a legalized position of innocence rationalizing imperial, national, or colonial impression of power, control, and linguistic and cultural erasure or accommodation without permission. And this is, of course, is an amendment of Mary Pratt's fine work. But tied to this is these, these arcs of, of hegemonies of language, and they're hydra-headed and contradictory and fragile and with seeming resolutions by violence. At the same time, however, there is there, it's, it's binary almost, uh, a connectivity to, to persuasions and negotiations and revolt and appropriations and reliance. And after 500 years, and I hear, I, I use the word freaking when I really mean something else, we have the sanctity of Chimayo of New Mexico seeming to innocently represent their result. And this is the Santuario Chimayo in uh, New Mexico and it's entitled Tres Culturas, and it shows on the left side uh, an American cowboy type person reading the Bible in English to an indigenous person in the middle, uh, kneeling before him uh, with feathers being shown as a blessing to his reading. And then the uh, Hispano Mexicano kneeling as well in rapture to the word of God in English. All of this is sanctified by a uh, representation of the Virgen in the background. So we have this, this kind of narrative uh, that uh, is expressed even in a, in a sanctified place like Chimayo. It, it is a pernicious sort of statement and narrative that masks then the, 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 the narrative of the population itself into a type, into a stereotype, into a category rather than in a as a dynamic population. And all of this, of course, takes place within this much broader region that I've called the Southwest North American region. And I treat this as, as, as theoretically from a political ecology point of view. And you have these enormous swaths of land that have no border. And one of the, one of the aspects of this is that we all have to understand is that these lines on this map are demarcating south to north uh, of, of Mexico and the United States, in fact, are cross cuts by, by these huge ecological swaths, uh, which in fact integrate the entire region in reality. But the other aspect of this is that one must recall that these lines themselves are not uh, equal to the permanency of the ecological region itself. And in fact, were only created two grandmothers ago. But we have to understand that in fact, this region is much broader, much larger than, 
than, than uh, this representation. And in the pre-Hispanic period, we see that in fact, you have this entire region much in a, a much greater swath of very complex systems prior to the, to the 15th century. Most of these very complex systems had terminated by our 1450, uh, 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 because, basically because of the deleterious effects of, of uh, climatic changes, uh, one due to the Little Ice Age, which uh, began very early on at about the 13th century, uh, which affected the entire region as well, and overpopulation and over, over uh, extraction of, of natural resources. But you can see that these very complex systems prior to the arrival of the Spanish in 1540 were in fact quite well integrated into the ecology of the region with its own mode of production, as well as its own organizational principles, including trade, mining, wars, agriculture, um, consisting of subsistence farming, collection farming, incipient statelets, urban towns, complex centers. And all of these, of course, have enormous implications for uh, modes of production politically and socially and culturally and economically, and of course, linguistically. These are the tribal versions of those complex systems that in fact uh, developed after the uh, diminution of those systems themselves and split basically into what I would uh, consider tribal groups. But nevertheless, even within this, this complex after, uh, after the, the 15th century, uh, you still have other, other systems that are quite complex, uh, especially for example, confederations, political confederations that existed throughout this region as well. The pre-Hispanic modes of communication for this for up to and including up through the Spanish to the Spanish period, of course, is bilingualism, lingua franca, sign language, and long distance telegraph. And as a matter of fact, what's interesting is the, the Spanish uh, documents of the period uh, describe uh, how in fact, uh, different confederations com communicated with each other uh, with uh, through smoke signals. Uh, and uh, bilingualism, of course, uh, is also, uh, greatly described in many of the works of, of, during the Spanish period, and the capacity and ability of populations to speak to each other bilingually, trilingually as well, and through sign language and a lingua fran franca, which really emerges out of Uto Stecan as well. The Spanish begin their trek into this region in 1540 with Coronado. Uh, through a, a really through a, a, a series of, of mythic uh, rationales, but behind their uh, colonization, uh, of course, beginning very early 1521 uh, with the uh, defeat of, 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 of central Mexico and then traveling up through, through the north uh, with Coronado in 1540. These are all rationalized by a, a, uh, the seeing man syndrome statements. And that is, for example, the 1573 ordinance of discovery, which basically says anything you see belongs to the crown, including people, land, language, and anything else that's there. There's also the act of possession. And that is uh, these folks had the tendency of declaring uh, ownership uh, for the crown uh, as soon as they, they uh, went into a place that was in fact unfamiliar to them and declared it uh, part of the empire itself. Uh, and they actually did uh, also perform plays at the time. Uh, for example, Oñate crosses the Rio Grande River into what is now New Mexico. And uh, in fact, uh, conducts a play written by one of his captains. And they use, uh, they use a, a very expressive means of, of in fact, displaying their, their, their plays and their performances by the use of cannon, which was also an indication that in fact, uh, this may, the cannons themselves would be utilized uh, for, for any act of resistance. As well as uh, upon entering the, the pueblos, they in fact declared acts of vassalage. Uh, and all of these, these uh, various rationalizations then provided a kind of innocent patina to their, uh, to their entrance as well as to their conquest, as well as to their use of trial by fire and sword if any opposition occurred. The missionizing system, uh, of course, was one in which it which sought to reduce uh, any desperate tribes into, into central places. They used the those towns that were already available as 
places for uh, adjoining missions. Um, so from 1540 uh, and then uh, to 1595, uh, you have various explorations until the advent of of, of uh, Oñate in 1598. And that entrance and colonization of New Mexico uh, then provides the, the basis for the Spanish empire into the Southwest North American region itself. Uh, but by 1680, the indigenous population of course had pretty well tired of, of the extraction of its, of its resources, the implementation of the repartimiento and other forms of control, uh, as well as for, forbidding uh, 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 both ritual activities as well as belief systems, uh, ending in the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, which decimated the entire population, the colonial population of New Mexico and removed really the Spanish empire uh, from this region until the 1690s. The aftermath of the Pueblo Revolt really resulted in, in a kind of uh, uneasy alliance between indigenous populations of this, this region and the Spanish itself. Later expansions by, in the 18th, early 18th century by, by um, uh, especially the Jesuits into Sonora and to what became Arizona and certainly into Texas uh, in the early uh, 17th and uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, early eight, 18th century and late 17th century uh, into Texas uh, and also into, into California, completed then the, the, the colonization, but it was an uneasy colonization in which in fact the Spanish were very much dependent on alliances with indigenous populations who in fact opposed uh, other tribal groups like the Comanches and the Utes uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, other, other, uh, and the Navajo, for example, as, as well. So the implementation then of the empire in terms of, 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 of language was a very much an artifact of the religious uh, schools themselves set up in various pueblos and in, in various missions uh, in which Latin was in fact was taught as the basis for uh, religiosity as well as the re religious system itself. But there was always constant discontent even after the reconquest of the region in uh, 1595 by the Vargas. Uh, th what I call a Pfeffercorn syndrome was a, a constant one in which uh, Pfeffercorn was a Jesuit uh, priest who complained mightily that in fact, that when uh, indigenous persons came to confession because many of them were forced to go to confession. They in fact spoke only in their own indigenous language and not in Spanish, even though they knew Spanish. And so Febricorn was uh, fit to be tied because even though he knew some, some of the indigenous languages like Pima, uh, nevertheless, uh, he uh, proposed that uh, this language is insufficient for them to be able to uh, share all of their sins. But one of the most interesting aspects of this is that there is uh, in this entire process, a process of ethnogenesis and linguistic diversity that also uh, is generated. And, and, and a perfect example of this are the, are the Genisaros. The Genisaros in fact, are indigenous populations who have been dislocated because of Spanish intrusions. And they themselves create uh, a, a, a category for themselves, i.e. Genisaros, uh, in which they were Spanicized because many of them had been Spanish slaves in households. And they created this, this document uh, in Spanish, uh, perhaps written by a Spanish helper or not. But, but the fact of the matter is what is important about this is the way in which this document is signed. It is not signed by the Spanish writer, rather it is signed in Spanish as Los Genisaros, which is an entirely new ethnic identity. So what is occurring, and this is a translation, which I'm not gonna go through it, but, but basically this provides you then also a listing of the signers themselves who came from different indigenous nations, but who acquired this newly, uh, this new, new kind of identity. 
But among the methods and mechanisms used by the Spanish, for example, was in fact performance. Performance was very much part of the kind of linguistic expressive formats by which to continue to colonize as well as to convert uh, indigenous populations to Catholicism. Uh, the Raramuri version of this is in the, and then I'll talk about the Bernalillo version in a bit, uh, is accentuated by the, by the 17th century in Chihuahua. And this is a, a modern rendition of the Matachines even in, in, to this day. And if, as you can see, the, the uh, clothing itself is a combination of what I would suggest to you are 15th century Italian opera uh, attire as well as indigenous blending of the two. So what you have is the Matachines is a kind of performance dance, very complicated. And we can talk a little bit about that later on. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is this is one of, one of the means of not only conquest, but also of Spanish maintenance. 1821, of course, this is a moot point with uh, uh, the Mexican independence. Uh, the colonial uh, uh, <clears throat> architecture is removed and replaced by the Mexican Republic. <clears throat> but the Mexican Republic's presence in the Southwest North American region, especially in the Northern side of it, uh, was uh, in fact uh, relatively limited only between 1821 and 1846. Because 1846, of course, what occurs is uh, the uh, American conquest of Mexico, uh, which had, which followed in fact, the Texas revolution of 1835, itself basically consisting of two underlying dynamics one of which was uh, uh, a desire to maintain slavery in Texas. And secondly, was a fight against uh, Mexican centralized government, both of which combined to create the uh, Texas revolt. Uh, Texas, of course, became part of the United States uh, in 1845, as it was uh, annexed by the United States to become part of the United States as a slave state. And this really then becomes part of the genesis for the American-Mexican War and the conquest of Mexico between 1846 and 1848. So the American Entrada, the American Conquest, and by the way, people utilize all sorts of nomenclature to describe this process of, of uh, conquest as annexation or integration or uh, other such words that are used in order to mask the seeing man syndrome of, of <clears throat> rationalizing the conquest itself in terms especially of manifest destiny, which was this kind of notion that uh, um, Americans were destined uh, to control not only from the East Coast, but all the way to the West Coast. And of course they succeeded with the conquest of Mexico itself. And what was, one has to understand is as a matter of fact, for two years, uh, the American army did inhabit Mexico City. So understand that this is a conquest with the border that was created uh, after 1848, uh, 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 implemented and imposed uh, as the aftermath of conquest. What occurs of course with this is uh, uh, the penetration of early American, the very early American form of industrial production. And with it, this, uh, uh, what I would suggest is the subjugation of language, uh, in, this, in this case, both Spanish and indigenous languages, by especially by American schooling. And there were various ways in which to do this for Native Americans. Uh, they established schools only for uh, Native peoples. And this, this particular slip here is a discharge from school uh, for uh, three persons, uh, one of which, uh, two of which, uh, one. Uh, Juan Perea and Benito uh, Lezada uh, are, are seen as being too Mexican. That is, uh, because there's already an ethnogenesis occurring in this period, but they're distinguishing persons according to melanin. And so you have this kind of racialization occurring at the same time. But in fact, from one point of view, one might say these Mexican children who had been previously identified as indigenous were, were in fact done a favor by not in fact having to go through these schools because in fact, in many of these schools, more than four to 500 indigenous youth, many uh, died 
uh, because of uh, tuberculosis, maltreatment, and a variety of other mistreatments uh, in these schools. But for what happened to Mexican origin, children then was in fact to become erased uh, in schools which promulgated the notion of, of English only even back in the 19th century. So with Mexican schools also were what I would suggest are Mexican curriculums. And the curriculums themselves were always dumbed down. So you had English for, for example, for communication, you had mathematics for everyday use, you had science for very, not very simple, simple kinds of processes. And Mexican schools generally were not equal, but rather uh, unequal as well. But at the same time, what is happening uh, after uh, 1848 is even uh, populations themselves the Mexican origin populations themselves are in fact inventing all sorts of ways to deal with this new uh, English speaking uh, industrial behemoth that uh, is in fact penetrating uh, all of this region in construction, mining, uh, later railroads in the 1880s, uh, agriculture, ranching, you name it. Uh, and, and this industrial motor production of course led to great urbanization and for the need of labor. And of course, the closest labor was that which was just right across the street called the US-Mexican border. And the, the reliance on Mexican labor uh, for the formation of the industrial motor production in the Southwest North American region on both sides of the border, in fact, is owed to Mexican labor itself, which really became a trans-border process. On the other hand, there were people like Jose Agapito Olivas, who in 1860 invented this word list of, of Ute in Spanish and English. And these are just a few examples of this. And later on, we can, we can talk a little bit more uh, at depth with it. But what also occurs is between uh, the American conquest in 1900 is uh, the, the rise of not only the industrial motor production on both sides of the, of the Southwest North American region, but also on the Mexican side of of uh, the Mexican dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, who insists on inviting uh, American uh, uh, businesses into, into Mexico and huge swaths of Mexico in fact are very much owned by both British as well as American companies in mining and in agriculture, in ranching, uh, cattle raising uh, and a variety of it. So you have also this kind of uh, a cultural as well impact of the United States on both sides of the border. So what emerges in a very interesting kind of way is an American Mexican version uh, of this region itself, uh, both Mexican and American, but unequal because in fact, you have an unequal political economy being established at the same time. And with that establishment is uh, the the Mexican Revolution, which occurs in 1910, which is really a transborder phenomena, uh, which crosses back and forth, uh, as well as uh, between 1910, uh, between 1900 and about 1940, you have this rise of kind of this eugenics oriented, hydra headed evolution as well, penetrating schools and penetrating as, 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 as uh, the gestalt, uh, the racialized gestalt of the Mexican population as being one that was in fact uh, a hybrid population uh, that was necessary for its brawn, but not for its brains. On the other hand, it, the maintenance of language by, by Mexicans not, was not only due to uh, the need for Mexican labor and Mexican labor uh, uh, returning back to their points of origin, many of them, because many Mexicans had left uh, what became part of the United States back into Mexico and then returned back into, into, uh, into the United States as foreigners. And that's, that's, what, that's what's very interesting, is that, is that Mexicans became foreigners uh, in their own land. <laughs> and while American immigrants from uh, Europe uh, came into the United States and of course were instantly transformed uh, into Americans, even though many of them could not speak English. Uh, and that's the, one of the most interesting uh, aspects of this contradiction of language hegemony 
uh, in the Southwest North American region. But Mexicans maintained uh, their linguistic capacities basically because of newspapers. And that is they developed newspapers. So in Arizona, for example, between 1877 uh, and 1921, they, for, they formed 92 newspapers. In New Mexico, between 1844 and 1960, 357 newspapers. In Texas, in the 19th century to, to the 20th century, over 300 in California, 192. And so what you have is this syncretism of language that's occurring. You have Spanish being maintained through newspapers and as well as through films, I might point out, especially after uh, the, the rise of the talkies uh, in the 1920s. So the communication modes for Mexicans uh, were, became uh, one in which bilingualism was rather the standard norm for many Mexicans, as well as, for example, I might point out, some Americans became highly Mexicanized and married Mexican women, especially up to 1880, uh, prior to the introduction of the railroad, so that their children became uh, totally bilingual. I wanted to give you just an example of that kind of translanguaging uh, in this uh, card uh, that was written in 1970, uh, which is not that all long ago, 50 some years ago. And here you have prior to the advent of, of uh, cards in Spanish, Mexicans then made do with what you had. So here you have a, a card that says, viejito querido, my little old man, have a happy birthday, Darty, make it wonderful th all through, and don't stop there, but have a year that's very happy too. And darling, always keep in mind that someone, namely me, thinks that you are wonderful and dear as you can be. She then switches to Spanish, te quiero mucho, tu viejita regan regañona, that is, uh, I love you very much, your old uh, complaining lady, uh, y, y le pido mucho a Dios, and I pray to God, que nos cuide a los dos, that God protects us both. Y nos, uh, uh, I can't quite tell here. Y, y que nos parece, parecía uh, uh, para llevar una vida tranquila y feliz, which is up on the left, left hand side. Que Dios nuestro Señor, muchos años de, de vida, and so on, and so on, and so on. Love, siempre, luz, April 28th, 1971. So Mexicans, in fact, negotiated language very early on uh, by maintaining language, especially through newspapers. Unfortunately, schools generally had uh, the penchant uh, of removing the language itself. And I'm not going to get into all of this other stuff, but uh, basically suggest to you that the conquest and hegemony of language of the Southwest region continues even to this day. Uh, and there are different versions of this it's what I call pinchy English only, or uh, I don't want to use the English word. Uh, <laughs> pinchy English means uh, damn, uh, damn English only, which is a combination, combination of what I would suggest is white racism, uh, de demographic imposition, and the Totomic founders themselves harken back uh, to the eugenics movement of the 1920s. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's something that, that one can explore in the book itself. So given the demography of the region up to the present, uh, in 2017, we're looking at 57.5 million persons of Hispanic descent, of which 63.2% are of Mexican origin. And most of the growth, by the way, of this segment of the population is due to birth, not due to immigration, especially since uh, 1990. Between 1970 and 1990, you have a quite it's an explosive uh, immigration process occurring between 1990 and 2022. It's mostly uh, a, a diminution of immigration and a rise of birth rates. And you can see that this is distributed to other Hispanic uh, Americans as well. Complaints, of course, about language, about uh, Mexicans speaking only Spanish and so on and so on and so on is part of what I would call the, the racialized uh, seen man syndrome in the United States in which language is used as a kind of racialized uh, trope uh, to uh, indicate differences. But when you, have to, when you look at the actual percentages of non-English speakers in Arizona, in 1899, it was 28.2%. That's only 40 years uh, after the Gatson Purchase. In 2011, it's 5.9%. 2012, 
and in 2022, it's about the same. California, you see the percentages there, the, the not great difference. And look at New Mexico from 65.1% to 4.6% in 2011. Texas, 5.9% to 8.9%. And it had to do in Texas, especially with the, the decrease in population in Texas. So the final discontent of the book is the bilingual brain literature that I discuss um, pretty thoroughly. And basically what we know is that we, uh, you, you do have a great deal of advantage uh, being bilingual. All the bio, bio and neural research certainly shows this. It expands executive functions. There seems to be some great flagging with bilingual education and then it recuperates in the year six to seven and then they excel, uh, the populations who are monolingual. The future for, for this population, I think, is uh, out with immersion that is being immersed in, in English seven hours a day and then to the detriment of the development in, in the sciences and in literature and in the humanities and learning uh, over and over how to pronounce uh, C. Uh, Jane Run, C. Jack Play. The indigenous aspect of this I have not stressed, but I can tell you that on the Mexican side, uh, indigenous populations were rendered uh, in the same format as they were on the American side. As a matter of fact, the Me Mexicans used the uh, Indian school model, the militarized model uh, in Mexico to in fact, try to reduce uh, the language capacity of indigenous children in Mexico as well. In the present indigenous education itself is becoming revitalized dictionaries, children's books, and a resurgence of indigenous selves, selves through Mexico, and I might point out through the United States as well. But what is for me, let me conclude only with this statement, which I'm not going to remark about, but rather to have you really consider the original premises for this. And that is that if one treats people without a history, then one reduces their, their dynamic and their capacities to be human as well as the seeing, seeing eye syndrome, uh, seeing man syndrome, which rationalizes uh, hegemony in all of its various formats with this uh, uh, quotation that I just found this morning in one of the web pages concerning indigenous languages. Arizona is one of two states where the leading foreign language aside from Spanish is Navajo. Those who identify as part of the Native American Navajo people are also referred to as the Diné, meaning the people, the children of the people. The Navajo Nation stretches over 27,000 square miles across Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. So even to this day, the indigenous man syndrome, as well as creating populations without a history, still seems to be regurgitated even by these innocent seeming statements. Thank you. Okay. Um, if Anthony would like to um, join us or join with Carlos and uh, talk about uh, that presentation. Right, thank you, Martin. I'd be delighted to, I hope people can hear me. Um, yes, we can hear you. Oh, yes. this, this is good. Um, where to begin this presentation that Carlos has given us and the slides that he's presented are just so rich and touch on so many themes. Um, I read the book, I enjoyed it. Um, it got better as it went on. Uh, the notes of personal history in it added to it greatly, and it touches on so many themes. And I wrote my review in 2020, and people will remember that in 2020, the President of the United States was a man who had decided that what was needed to protect the United States from malevolent incomers and people who wish to do the American dream of violence was a wall along the Rio Grande. 
And as we know, this did not work out well. It cost a lot of money for very little masonry and has been abandoned. Now in 2022, where the man in question is still mouldering and chuntering in the background, but is no longer president, we see that the situation has changed a lot. The United States has, as I believe, Secretary of the Interior, a woman from one, one of the groups who would have been mislabeled in the early 20th century as a Pueblo Indian, Deb Harland, who is uh, from Laguna Pueblo, and who is a, a Carison speaker. Uh, and yet the situation which um, Carlos describes are, are by no means dead letters. Um, one point that you made about the, the schools and the discovery of um, the high degree of mortality in Indian boarding schools is something which has been much in the news recently. First of all, in Canada, in which that ambiguous institution, the Roman Catholic Church, played a large part in establishing such schools, as indeed did the Church of Canada and so on. But also in the United States uh, was a discovery of graves and human remains from the sites of places where such schools had been established. And this is one of the more chilling uh, manifestations of hegemony and what it can amount to. Um, linguistic manifestations are disturbing enough. There is little that is positive to be said upon the imposition of one culture upon another, and nothing positive to be said on the attempted extirpation of one culture by another. And I, I would point out that in the case of the United States, uh, the greater Southwest, the Southwest North American region is one place where it has happened, but is far from being the only one. And I can quote you cases from Louisiana, Alaska, and Guam. Um, And if we think back to one of the early maps that Carlos showed us of the groups where they were living uh, before uh, European incursions in the 16th century and afterwards, we'll see some familiar names, names that will be known to people who know something about the ethnogeography of the area. And there'll be some names that are far less familiar. Uh, such as the, the Soe, for example, in, in northwest Mexico, or the Humano, people we know from history, but about whose language we know very little. We know nothing about what the Humano spoke, for example. We know that they were quite important in their time, but nobody has ever been able to prove that they spoke an Athabascan language like the Navajo and the Diné and the Apaches, or the Uto Aztecan language, or what? It's a gap in our historical record because the people who were the seeing men of the days didn't care. And at the edge of that map, on the coastal littorals of Texas, we see um, the Karankwa. Um, I need to fess up here. I have an interest in the Karankwa and the language because um, I wrote my master's thesis on the Karankwa language in the days before an MPhil was code for failed PhD and was actually a justifiably laudable qualification in itself. I worked on sources available on the Karankwa language, including material collected by a grumpy Swiss ethnologist um, from a white woman who'd grown up in coastal Texas and had spent most of her life actually living just outside 
Boston, Massachusetts, in the, the mill town of Lynn, uh, the reason that there were not more resources on the language from the 19th century is because although the Karankwas were doing quite well in the days when Texas was de facto part of Mexico, soon after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in the 1840s, it was resolved by the Anglo-Americans that um, the Texas was to be cleansed, their kind of word, not mine, I hasten to word, of native peoples. And the long and the short of it is that the Caranquas were chased onto Padre Island, just in Texas, not far from Mexico, and were extirpated in November and December 19, uh, 1858. So the reason we don't know as much about their culture and language as we might like to think is because they were obliterated from history. And this is one of the most clear examples of hegemonic genocide in this particular region on the part of English-speaking Americans. Carlos has made a most compelling case for a re-examination with full attribution and full understanding of the sources of what happened in these situations, who imposed what on whom, and what were the consequences, and what happened to the people who were discriminated against or oppressed. And looking at this question from the viewpoint of language, you know, a multifocal way, uh, for this is what Carlos has done, and there are yet other ways in which this could be employed, um, is one of the most powerful and one of the most searching and effective ways of getting to understand more about a situation which is often only spoken of in historical documents that happen to have come down to us by the merest chance. The letter of the Kenny Saros being a very good example. There are several others from the area, uh, the greater region. Uh, we know bits about cultures that had thrived there uh, and were eliminated. And what we know about many of these cultures is because by pure chance, certain documents have survived that help to fill in a bit of the ethnological picture of the area. There are other things that could be said about interaction between English, Spanish, and indigenous languages in this area. I would like to commend for one thing, um, the work of William Bright, the late Bill Bright of UCLA, um, who published an extremely good article in the journal Romance Philology um, on Hispanisms, words of Spanish origin in Southwest Indian languages in or around 1998, which pays a lot of careful attention to the history of the area. He himself is a native of a smallish town in, in Southern California. Uh, he'd grown up hearing Spanish and was very much sympathetic to the diversity of cultures that he found uh, himself surrounded by as a child growing up in Oxnard. Um, while I can, I'd just like to make a plug if I may, for a piece of work that is evolving at the moment, uh, in which I have very little of a hand, it's evolving here at Edge Hill University, as a forthcoming PhD uh, dissertation by a teacher of Spanish at our university called Katia Adimora, who is looking at a discourse analysis of the discourse surrounding the wall, 
the one that Mr. Trump is so keen on, and how it is being portrayed in English language newspapers of the United States and in Spanish language newspapers of Mexico, and is using corpus linguistics and a discourse oriented approach to see what the histories and the narratives of this have to tell us. So to sum up, um, Carlos's work is very wide ranging, focused with a good sense of personal tradition, which uh, one can read about in the um, book. Um, it's interesting that um, people in his family had connections with the family of uh, the a great American singer of Mexican extraction, Linda Ronstadt, who in the past few years has tragically been silenced because of the effects of Parkinson's disease. And there is a strong undercurrent of completely justified outrage in this work. And as we read the later chapters, we think all these problems that we read about, about bilingual education and English only, these are things that were being discussed 30, 40, 50 years ago in the United States and elsewhere. And we thought that people had come up with the answers to these problems, a way to alleviate the chaos that these problems sometimes caused. And yet, here they are emerging again and again. It's as if we're playing a kind of whack-a-mole. We, we solve a problem, we do the analysis of the situation that causes the problem, we diagnose the cause, we treat the root causes and not just the symptoms, we provide a solution, things should be better off, and then there again, a couple of generations down the line, here we are again repeating the same calls for help because of the same issues. And one of the senses I took away from the later chapters of Carlos's book is how slow many authorities are to learn from what has already been done. And in many cases, they are slow to learn because the answers to the questions that are raised simply do not fit neatly or comfortably into their prevailing ideology. And they will allow nothing to collide with their ideology and they will go ahead and nothing will be allowed to interfere with their, their own vistas of illimitable ignorance. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, if uh, Carlos, did you want to uh, reply to anything that Anthony said? Um, Anthony was eloquent. Thank you where I was normative. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm waiting, Anthony, for the shoot to drop pretty soon, again, of given the terrible political bifurcation in the present. Mm. I'm waiting for the English only racial tropes to emerge again. Even though we have managed in some places, certainly California and even freaking Arizona <laughs> hmm. uh, to um, convince 
uh, people that the immersion version of language learning is detrimental to the long-term cognitive development of children and that we need something better than that. But I'm waiting for that shoot to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't, uh, most of the tropes have to do with uh, health. That is, uh, let's make sure that those disease brown people don't cross over uh, or you know, let's let's re, 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 reinstate the wall, even though mm. there have been more than 6,000 breaches in that wall, by the way, I, I, I hate to point out. Not only that, but there's now a, a junkyard business uh, utilizing part, parts of the wall in Mexico. Wonderful. Uh, and, and of course, Mexicans have, have this wonderful sense of humor uh, that they sometimes display by cutting a piece of the of the wall, a panel, putting a hinge on it, and then having people come through that hinged panel part, and and, and the statement is basically, look how silly you are to do this, right? And look what we can do, and look how creative we are, and of course, then there's all of the all of the um, the memes and, <laughs> and all of the the joking stuff that occurs but but the wall itself has been given life by by uh electronic games there's a game now uh developed by one of the the game developers i forget which uh in which uh the game involves maintaining the wall to protect your home that's the message Mm. The message is there in order to protect your your home, you know, somewhere in Kipsky, Illinois, or wherever. So this trope then has these other means, especially uh, the the kind of the social uh, network kind of communication. Uh, these tropes are are emerging, and whenever those tropes emerge like that, you know that something else is going to follow from a policy angle point of view. Mm -hmm. Right now, the state of Arizona is contemplating a whole bunch of other kinds of things having to do with, of course, abortion, with voting, uh, and all, of, all the rest of that. But I'm just waiting for the shoe to drop yes. pretty soon, in spite of what we know. That's, that's, that's the terribleness of this. I think if the Democrats do badly in the midterms, as they probably will, I'm afraid, uh, you won't have long to wait before you hear that second shoe drop. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, see, I see that. I see that coming. And, and we're going to have to be prepared for it. Mm. You know? I mean, we've, we've been fighting these guys uh, in many, many ways, uh, including the president of our university has been uh, a really smart, genuinely strategic individual in dealing with these folks. Um, on, on the other hand, he was named the number one enemy of education <laughs> by right-wing folks. And uh, I was insulted because I was named number two. Uh, and I, I, call, I, called, I called our president and I said, you know, I really resent your being named number one and you need to vacate your spot uh, in my stead. So- uh, <laughs> Must try harder. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um We've opened up officially to questions from the um, audience. So if you've got a question, you can either uh, just raise your hand um, or you can put it onto the chat or you can put it into the Q&A section, which is uh, down the bottom of the screen for you. Um, so you can ask a question in any, any of those ways. In the meantime, I do have a question for Carlos, and that is, um, I unfortunately haven't had, a, had enough time to read through the book completely, but what I've read, I'm very impressed by. Um, and it, I do intend to um, not just read it through, but sit, settle down the one uh, winter evening and uh, you know read it through as a single thing. Um, but my question is, you're talking about a lot of different um, 
language communities here, and you're talking over quite a long time of these language communities. Uh, have you noticed or have you identified during that long period of time any creolization between the languages? Um, so Nadene might, you know, creolized with English and Spanish. And is there any any trend in those creolizations if they have actually occurred? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and we use Spanglish all the time. Ah, uh, of course, yes. <laughs> that that's the trans language kind of experiment that we do, and 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 we do, and we do it. You see, you've got to really know both languages in order to do it well, though. Uh, you, you really must be uh, uh, at, 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 a, at a very good level of knowledge of, of, of both languages in order to do it well, uh, because it's, it, 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 it's, it, it grammatically makes sense if you were to analyze the translanguaging process. It's really interesting the way in which we do this kind of stuff. Uh, and we, 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 we do it thoughtlessly because uh, it, it's, it's uh, what we know, or rather what we learn uh, linguistically is so is at the molecular level, you know, both cognitively as well as emotively. Uh, one, of the, one of the aspects that I tried to have the readers understand was the profundity of language learning. That it's not just a matter of a map uh, lobbying on to some kind of deep structure capacity, but rather that it has language learning in all of its emotive range from pain to, to, to desire to laughter to happiness. All of these ranges of emotional content are also part and parcel of the learning of the languages themselves. So that when you force a child, either by force or by uh, creating a conviction of so-called betterment, i.e. this is what you should aspire to if you want to achieve, the message is basically the same, but the range of emotional imprint, if you want, is different. Uh, and in the latter, in the acquisition of, of being convinced to make the other language your primary source of communication as well as achievement, provides you also with an innocence to forget that which you knew. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's a terribly profound process. Now, on the other hand, if you do the force business, the corporal punishment approach, like it was done to my generation and not only my generation, but so many generations following that probably up to about 1965, you have this, this terrible, painful contentiousness, even in speaking the language you wish, which you were forced to speak. There's a, almost a resentment of having to communicate in this language that you were, <coughs> excuse me, that you were forced to learn in lieu of the other one. And so at the psychodynamic, emotional level of things, there's this range of, of effect, of imposition, as well as this range of response. So I have a degree, a master's degree in English, besides anthropology. And I am sure that I got the degree in English, not only because I loved the bard, and by the way, I, nurt I was nurtured on Shakespeare and Othello and on all the great works. I loved, I loved the, the, the damn stuff, as well as, as um, Cervantes, 
who's writing in the same period. These guys are writing at the same time about their times, you know. And if I had been given an opportunity early on as a child to, to learn both Cervantes and Shakespeare with ease and with affection and with support and with, I hate to say it, with love, then I perhaps wouldn't even have acquired a master's in English because that was my payback. My payback was to teach American children English from a Mexican. And that's the wrong damn reason to do it. <laughs> it's a good reason though. <laughs> um, huh? It's a good reason. Um, we've got a question coming from the audience. Um, and it's actually from you, Carlos, although I suspect it's not really from you. Um, no, it's, it's not from me. <laughs> no. It's Rob, uh, Roberto uh, Perez, Perez, Perez Diaz, who is a, who is a translator, uh, oh. a court translator. Thanks. The, the, the question is, the letter signed by Los uh, Genisaros uh, signify an emerging political formation. Did that continue after the letter was written? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the Genizaros played major roles in the reestablishment of some of the pueblos that had been abandoned. Uh, rather, and, and it combined Genizaros, some of the original Spanish colonists, and the new colonists hmm. who came in after the Pueblo Revolt, after 1695. And what's interesting, and, and, and Tony, you really, you'll, you're going to love this, because it's not it's not in the book. It's in something else that I'm going to send you on Jose Agapito Olivas. Uh, only 23% of the original colonists returned to New Mexico after the Pueblo Revolt. All the rest were from central Mexico or from Zacatecas. Mm -hmm. Now, what is interesting was that when they set up the villages for these newly arriving colonists from Mexico, they were not known as Españoles, but rather they were referred to by the Vargas as, as Españoles Mexicanos, or as Mexicanos Españoles, or as Vecinos Mexicanos. Now, what is interesting, however, is that Mexico didn't exist. Hmm. It didn't exist in 1695. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you had El Valle de Mexico. Yeah. El Valle de Mexico. But if you're from Zacatecas, why are you being referred to, or San Luis Potosí, mm. why are you being referred to by the Central Mexican term? And, and that's, and I have a hypothesis and only a hypothesis. And that is that by 1695, the Henisado kind of admixture, both genetic and cultural, had already made moot the vaunted caste system. Mm. And to refer to people by those caste terms was, as we say in Spanish, era inútil. <laughs> mm. it, was, it, it was meaningless. Yeah. And perhaps the hypothesis runs that the term Mexican came to designate the mestizo, came to designate now a place and space of persons identified as Mexicanos. Yeah. Maybe. That's, a hypo that's just a hypothesis. Anyway, but I thought, I thought you would be interested in that. And yeah. Jose Agapito Olivas, Tony, yeah. if I may. Jose Agapito Olivas is born in 1842, which means that he was born as a Mexican citizen, remember, because yeah. Mexico is still in control until 1848. On the other hand, his own father was born in Nueva España. He was born in, New in Nuevo Mexico, mm. Nuevo España. So you have, and then 1848 occurs 
And what does Jose Agapito do in 1860? Develop a what? A youth Spanish English dictionary. Now he's become an American Mexican. Yeah. Because now there is there is such a thing to become. That's right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I was I was going to say uh, uh, yeah, um, until the early 19th century. I mean, what we think of as Mexico, I think, largely being being referred to as New Spain. I mean, you know, Ben sure. has, you know, the conquest of New Spain and so on. Yeah. I mean, people knew the term Mexico because of the Valley of Mexico. Yeah. And. In, in writings, in linguistic writings from certainly the 18th century onwards and perhaps even further back, if you see something described as Mexicano, you know that it's a discussion of Nahuatl. Yeah. So that's, that's taken as the default Mexican language. Uh, in, the, in the same way, you, know, you, know, you see something on, on Chileno, it's, it's going to be about uh, Mapudungun. And uh, any description of me Mexicano is, is not to be taken as a description, say, of, of, of the variety, uh, whatever variety of Mexican Spanish the person would have been surrounded by. Um, but um, as time goes on, there's greater recognition, there's a greater range of, of languages in Mexico than just now out in Spanish. And uh, the term Mexicano for, for Mexican or Me Mexican in French gets used less and less, but it's still hanging on in there grimly mm -hmm. into the late 19th century when right. you've got people like Rémy Simeon compiling his massive Nahuatl dictionary and, and stuff like that. It's, um, a, as a localized term with a specific meaning, it, it's, History is a long one, and it takes a long time to to die out that way. Um, yeah, see, what's what's um, what's, what's uh, interesting to me is the Vargas in 1695 mm. writing about vecinos mexicanos and españoles mexicanos and mexicanos españoles, and then that term gets repeated in following yeah. documents. And that's that that's that's um, interesting. And the other thing that I shared with you when when, when we spoke there before yesterday, mm -hmm. that if you speak to a nuevo Mexicano who is allegedly as as español as possible, right, in Spanish, and you ask about the background, he'll answer, "Soy Mexicano de aquí. I'm a Mexican from here." Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you ask him in English. Many times in accented English, you will say, I'm Spanish. <laughs> yeah. you know? And it, which breaks me up. <laughs> so, so, that, 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 so depending on the language that you use, that's going to determine the response of identity. Yeah. But, okay. it, but it's not Espanol. And, that, and no. that's, to me, what is interesting. Yeah. It's not... He's not going to answer you in Spanish and say "soy español." He's going to say "soy mexicano de aquí." Yeah. So the you know, the, the the patrial uh, affiliation, the, the affiliation with the homeland, is the one that dominates in in his first language. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And he's got a, got another persona for use in in public. You know, when he has to speak English, one one that the Green Gods will understand, presumably. Or well, I, you know, remember that that, that statehood for New Mexico was very much an artifact of ethnogenetically acquiring Spanish identity. Yeah. Okay, because that's what would give the visiting congressional uh, groups that came into New Mexico and in Arizona to find out whether Arizona and New Mexico were worthy of, 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 of statehood. Mm. They, what they did is they had a series of, of, of hearings and in these hearings, they, de they determined that most, most persons in Nuevo Mexico spoke Spanish and about half of the persons in Arizona spoke English or, or more. Mm. Uh, so, but what New Mexicans did, New Mexican politicians did, was to make Spanish a legitimate language in politics. Yes. So that even American candidates 
that is English speaking American candidates who were vying for political office in New Mexico either had to have a translator or they themselves learned Spanish. So in a, in a, in a very interesting kind of way, Spanish became a legitimate language in New Mexico mm. because of its political function. Yeah. And, and the first, one of the first state of representatives was, a, was a, in fact, a parish priest who wrote both in English and Spanish. So that language has been used for political purposes in a very effective way in New Mexico. But the downside of that is the denial of anything Mexican. And only those others, in a way, in a way, New Mexicans created Mexicans as the other in New Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's why I tell my students, I say, look, they're no good guys. Don't, don't look for good guys. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> Everybody is compelled to be out for their own interests. That's right. Because of the nature of the situation. Thanks yeah. to the seeing man who's, who's seeing sure. all and negotiating all and dispersing all. Um, so, and of course, playing one smaller group off against another yeah uh and it was ever thus i mean you can see the same thing in british politics and see in american politics and all the wide world over um i mean i i i remember being impressed when i was young reading the kind of book like you know the statesman's yearbook i was a nerdy child as some people who are listening to this will attest um discovering to my surprise and delight because i liked languages uh, that New Mexico in about 1971, which is when I first came across the factoid, um, Spanish was official, co-official with English. Yeah. I don't know if it still is. Um, it, and it, 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 yeah, it, it's, it's kind of underground. Yeah. Kind uh, of underground. It, but it, even it, then, corporal punishment was rendered in New Mexico as well. Mm. They had pig pens for children. And children who spoke Spanish were put in a pig pen in the school, on the school grounds. By the way, the only reason that I didn't become a racist was because teachers would, would sometimes make us hide behind them when the principal came by to check to see who was speaking what. Uh -huh. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we've got three questions waiting for you. <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, we're having fun, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's not what you're here for. <laughs> um, we'll try to remember that, Martin. Okay. Uh, first of all, we've got Lola Martinez, and she's got a hand up. So I believe that she is brought into this the uh, discussion. Yes. Is that right, Hadi? Yeah, I can I can make her allow her to speak. Let's see if she still uh, is okay. fully with Before us. you do she that, had I'll her just hand up for a long time. <laughs> yes, I'll just say that um, we've also got Sally Coco Mafuene yes. with the question, and there's someone on the Q and A as well, um, David Montejano, um, who also has a question. So there are three people waiting. Let's get going with Lola. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, hello. Hola, Carlos. ¿Cómo estás? Hola, Lola Martínez. ¿Cómo estás? Pues bien, gracias. Um, I had a question about class and caste, and you brought caste up, and, and I was thinking a bit about class because of my own family history. If you were a middle-class Mexican-American family, um, second generation didn't speak Spanish much or Spanglish they did, but third generation worked hard to learn English, um, but also cast in the sense that my father's Mexican American family didn't like my mother's Spanish, you know, from Spain family. So all those, those issues, but also in the States um, in Northwest America, didn't you have rather elite families in which it was all right to speak Spanish as well as English, um, as long as you were very white, I guess. Um, anyway, so I was just wondering how all these things get mixed up because we know in Florida, Spanish speakers support Trump. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of complex, there are a lot of complex issues here. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You see, that, that's, that's where the full narratives have to be told. Hmm. Okay, rather than, and this is going back to Eric Wolf's criticism of what we do with knowledge, and that is that we segment it according to these, 
to, to the nomenclature of the special uh, the specialty that we happen to be in. And we don't take this much broader, what I would call complexity driven sort of approach, uh, rather than a kind of linear, let's just explain it with one variable or one reason. Uh, for example, uh, many of the parochial schools taught both English and Spanish. Mm. And as a matter of fact, in Tucson, the, uh, the academy, the St. Joseph's Academy in uh, Tucson stressed Latin American literature. Now, the children who went to that school initially, many of them were in fact, the children of Sonoran elites. Mm. Sonoran elites always uh, took advantage of the opportunity to go to a Catholic school in the United States in order to learn English. And as a matter of fact, bilingualism, I have to tell you, even, uh, you know, even within my own family, I, half of my cousins who came from Magdalena, Sonora, which is 60 miles south of the border, went to high school or elementary school in the United States in order to learn English. So that <clears throat> not unlike the indigenous populations, by the way, of the pre-Hispanic period, for many of us who consider ourselves transfronterizos, English and Spanish uh, were relatively common, especially for upper middle and upper class Mexicanos on both sides of the border. Now, if you look at places like Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, Brownsville, Nogales, mm. and so on, most Mexicanos on the south side of the region speak English to one degree or another and vice versa. And as a matter of fact, people go back and forth linguistically as much as they used to go back and forth physically. It was not a great big thing. And as a matter of fact, this border was culturally open and, and demo demographically cyclical. And that is people would come to the United States to work for a while, and then either they were booted out or they left on their own volition. And so you had this cyclical labor pool, which benefited all of the, the industrial modes of production as well, by the way, which they used the double weight structure and also some other shenanigans to pay less. So the dynamic of the border region is a very complex one with all of this variation that you just described, uh, Nola Martinez. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and there was an attribution of bilingualism to melanin. And more than likely that if you were melanin positive from the white notion point of view, the, 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 the Mexican version of racialized uh, uh, melanin, uh, th there was a relationship to it because class permitted you that kind of education. So caste, class, and racialized tropes all run together. You're and, absolutely right. Yeah, and I was, I was just going to mention very quickly in passing, there are other questions. At the time the wall went up, someone sent me, I can't remember who, an old clip of Cantiflas, the great Mexican comedian crossing the border, where the border is just a, a, a little, you know, it's just a little thing on sticks. And the American border guard is, you know, just go round. And Cantiflas is insisting, no, I want to enter officially. Raise <laughs> the barrier for me. Anyway, it, 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 it's a joke about how easy it was to go back and forth. Not and, only that, but it was, you know, it was very personal. Let me give you an example. When we would visit relatives uh, in Magdalena or any place in Sonora and, and, and on a return, and we crossed into the American side, it, usually if it was this one individual, he would greet my mother and say, Senora Vélez, como esta? Mm. That was the greeting for God's sakes. It wasn't, <laughs> I'm gonna kill you because yeah. you look like that. <laughs> yeah. It was a very different, different kind of gestalt. Mm. 
although in places like New York and, and Texas and Florida and even Chicago, when I go and they see my passport, they always speak Spanish to me first, which is interesting. That's a change from my childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. And I, th I think Montejano wants to say something or another. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the next question is Sally Coco. If, uh, Hanina, if you could put him onto the, um, here we go. Yes, they should be able to unmute now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can. yes. Okay. Thank you, Martin, for pronouncing my name so well. And <laughs> Carlos, Anthony, um, I'm so grateful uh, to have been able to attend this event. Um, I, I'm teaching a class now uh, titled Race, Ethnicity, Language, and Citizenship in the United States. And your presentation, Carlos, resonates so well with the course. And I'm embarrassed that I didn't know of your book until this event was announced because I would have arranged to invite you to talk to my class. Um, I very much appreciate it, um, among many things, the fact that you highlighted um, the fact that Native Americans have been changed into foreigners in their own land. At the time when Europeans, some of whom didn't speak English yet, were allowed to become citizens. And it actually reminds me of when I naturalized, whatever that means, but naturalized. <laughs> and I uh, went to take my test. And based on the instructions I had received, I had to prove that I was, that I could speak English. But I went to a Polish neighborhood to take my test. And Thank God I spoke, spoke, I speak English and could read English because the instructions were being given to us in Polish. The majority of people that were there in the room with me were Polish speakers. You see the contrast. Um, and somebody actually told me uh, an anecdote of a Native American in Washington, the state of Washington wanting to go to Canada. And at the border, they asked him, where is your passport? And he said, I don't need a passport. And the immigration officer said, look, everybody else shows a passport in order to cross the border. And he said, but I'm crossing no border. I'm Native American. And uh, <laughs> so you can imagine the confusion now in the system. Uh, but that, that is uh, really so revealing. And so I just had comments to make. And now that I have your book, I, uh, I mean, I have ordered your book while you, you were speaking, um, thanks to Amazon. Um, I will have to edit to two other books that were published the same year as yours. One is a book by Sean Harvey, Native Towns. I don't know if you know about it, but it's really a very nice compliment from a phylogenetic point of view uh, uh, to your book, um, uh, uh, it, it, especially because Sean Harvey highlights the fact that uh, the American government sponsored the study of indigenous languages, not because uh, Americans wanted to learn to speak indigenous languages, but because they wanted to figure out how to regroup Native Americans before driving them to the reservations and marginalize them. Uh, there's probably another site that must be highlighted because it, it is in this context that American linguistics was born. 
uh, just like African linguistics was born under similar conditions, people studying African languages, not so much because Europeans were interested in speaking African languages. The ultimate goal was to get Africans to learn European languages with not under similar pressures as in uh, uh, the Americas, uh, but uh, in Southern Africa, especially, the purpose was to marginalize uh, the indigenous people um, according to linguistic groupings. The second book is a book by, I think, a Polish-American, Dominica Baran, titled Language in Immigrant America. And there too, uh, um, you, you see uh, language policies and the need to uh, uh, force everybody to speak English and uh, learn English and uh, English becomes a kind of uh, uh, marker of new national identity. Actually, they even speak of American language. The one thing I find um, um, weak in the book is few references to nat the Native American experience. Because uh, one of the problems with Native Americans is if you don't speak English, then you don't you cannot participate in the new socioeconomic world order, even if you wanted to leave the reservations. So I'm, I'm really grateful that um, there is so much um, uh, discussion according to your presentation and according to the uh, table of contents of your book uh, of uh, um, the linguistic uh, aspects of fitting in the new socioeconomic world order, especially the Anglo socioeconomic world order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you are mute right now, Martin. Yes, <laughs> oh, okay. I, I realized that. Sorry. Um, finally, I realized it. Um, the next question is from David Montejano, and it says, Carlos, has your long interest in conquest and culture erasure given your work a pessimistic undercurrent? Any optimism to share with your avid followers? So, we have to keep on trucking. That's it. <laughs> the optimistic side is uh, I refuse to give up. I refuse to give in. Uh, and there's an old adage allegedly uh, spoken by Zapata uh, in Spanish, and I'll translate it. Es mejor morir parado. Que vivir hincado. It's better to die standing than to be alive kneeling. And that's the optimism comes from our ability to publish what we're doing, to be able to converse in the manner in which we are here in, to an audience much larger than the United States and to colleagues who not only listen, but who can help me sort stuff out that I don't quite understand as well. So the optimism really comes from also knowing that my students and students that I interact with uh, have developed into really intellectual gorillas. <laughs> and, uh, have created their own mechanisms for impact to better things, not only just for this, for the Mexican population, but also for all populations. Um, we still have this, this, this double whammy bang on native peoples mm. in which every day they're being erased, every single day fewer and fewer and fewer speakers 
Um, I, I tried to contribute a little bit to this in putting together the, the team that created the first Hopi English Dictionary uh, in order to try to uh, integrate the dictionary into uh, the elementary schools uh, in Hopi. Uh, and we've done some of that already. And, and some of the other uh, nations are doing similar things, but, but not at a scale which I think needs to be done. Uh, once, uh, once the language becomes only something to be taught or to be read in a, liter a specific literature and outside of the functions of everyday life, as well as everyday institutional um, operations, then the language becomes reduced. But that's the angle that we haven't really, uh, we really haven't attacked, especially in indigenous languages where the language itself has to become part of the institutions utilized by native peoples. They're, they're attempting some of this in Mexico now, uh, but the range of languages are so great that they're only concentrating on one or two. Mm. Yeah. So, so a language loss is, 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 is uh, the perennial problem, but we have to keep on trucking. That's all there is to it, period. That's the optimism. Mm. I think it's one of the grim ironies of history that a lot of this work in Mexico uh, is being done by organizations which are very much the engine of um, the same white American Protestant Bible totas that we saw in the uh, Tres Culturas de Chimayo, um, groups like the Summer Institute of Linguistics, which has done an immense amount of work on languages in Mexico and has done an immense amount of elaboration of linguistic technology and done lots of good that way. But it comes with a hidden agenda or, or a not so hidden agenda, uh, which is basically take these people and turn them into followers of what is essentially Midwest American Protestantism. Yeah. Uh, and I, when I saw that Tres Culturas statue, I, I was amused because I was looking at the, you know, the, 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 the American with his Bible addressing a, a recumbent or a kneeling Mexican. And I thought, you know, people who spoke Spanish had the full Bible in their own language before people who spoke English did. Um, <laughs> the Bible of Ferrara, for example, yeah. Most of it taken up by the Sephardim, uh, yeah. came out before uh, any, any complete Bible in English you, um, was published. And uh, consequently, they'd known about the Bible um, a lot longer than the, um, you know, the, the white American, the Anglo figures would have done. And um, because you know, the, the, the Mexicans were people who'd grown up with the Bible through hearing it at mass in Catholic church. And what's more, you know, the Catholic Bible is thicker than the, the Protestant one, one has to say, because there are more books in the Catholic Old Testament because it yeah. got translated via the Vulgate from the Septuagint before the Old Testament was reduced to books written in Hebrew. Um, so, I mean, Linguistic history is full of awkward ironies like this. Um, I mean, I, I hope that the SIL people's intentions, uh, well, their, their proselytizing intentions don't swamp their concerns about um, helping to preserve languages and help, helping to make uh, linguistic material available to those who would like to reacquire the language of their traditions and heritage and ancestors. Uh, in some cases, this will be the case. In other cases, it won't. And it has a lot to do with the, the personality of the individual um, SIL language operative uh, in question, I think. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's good that Mexico is taking an interest in this. I mean, uh, El Colegio de Mexico has been producing some very nice books over the past more than 40 years, and I think some are still coming out. A lot of capsule descriptions of indigenous Mexican languages with a set of sentences translated into them, about 600 words of vocabulary, uh, a short narrative and a bit of conversation and with, with audio stuff. In early days, of course, it was tapes, then CD-ROMs, and now it's online, um, which is great because you get a bit of homogenized um, material for as, as many languages as, as people can work on. Uh, and it's something that one wishes the United States were doing with its indigenous languages. Um, but the, these are just sort of drops of optimism in an ocean of indifference, really. Also, so it seems to cynical old me. Yeah, there, there are a couple of, of transborder drops as well. Mm. Uh, and then one of them is that National Public Radio has a bilingual program uh, that uh, focuses on indigenous languages. And, and mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, the broadcast itself is in uh, Purepecha, yeah. uh, as well as uh, Trique and a couple, a couple of other languages from the Oaxaca area, Oaxaca Chiapas area. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because as you well know, the, the very large presence of Purepechas and folks from Oaxaca Chiapas. But in Mexico as well, radio is one of the, one of the means by which to communicate with, in indigenous languages as well. Mm -hmm. That's sponsored by, by uh, INE, uh, by the Instituto Nacional Indigenista, which used to be INE. I don't know what it is now. I forget, it's, it has another term. Uh, it's been almost privatized in many ways. Um, yes. But that, that is at least a small drop as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's uh, very interesting here. It's being done in Purepecha. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, from a linguistic point of view, it's interesting because it's an isolate. It doesn't have any close relatives. And uh, of course, it was the first lang uh, indigenous Mexican language to have a newspaper published in it. Right. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, um, thanks in no small measure to um, a sympathetic president, uh, Lázaro Cárdenas, and um, the uh, operations of one of my linguistic heroes, Morris Swadesh, mm, who was yeah. sent, invited to Mexico to start up a, a newspaper in Purepecha, um, discovered he yeah, liked the idea, um, but the first thing he had to do was not just learn Purepecha or Tarascan, as it was then called, he had to learn Spanish, which he learned in a year and was giving lectures at the end of the year <laughs> universities in Spanish, <laughs> admirable linguistic achievement. Um, so yeah, I mean, this kind of news is always good news. But let me let me ask you a question: uh, any structural relationship between Tarasca, Purepacha, and Keres? Um, my guess would be no. Um, there is a work, there's a PhD out there yeah. by a lady called Kate Bellamy. I don't know where she's at now. She, she did her PhD at Leiden, but she's actually Yorkshire last. She, she's a Yorkshire person like me from um, Sheffield. And her PhD was basically a study of trying to track down any possible uh, linguistic relate, relatives of Purepecha. Mm. Uh, looking through all sorts of sources. She was very interested uh, in looking at terms, metallurgical terms, right. because you know, they can indicate trade routes and so on. Right. And uh, her overall conclusion was, yep, Purepecha is an isolate. It doesn't have any relatives. She looked throughout Mexico. She looked throughout um, La Latin America. I think she looked through the languages of the southern United States as well. Um, as, as for Carison, um, it's, it's, a, it's regarded now as a small family, two branches and um, seven members in all. Um, 
people used to think it was a single language. It's a yeah, small right. family. And, and it has an isolate as well, right? Yeah, he doesn't have any close relatives. I mean, yeah. it, it borrowed the Zuni word for fish and a few other cultural yeah. things. It's got kind of loads of Spanish in it as well, as you might expect. Yeah. No, other, otherwise it's it's uh, robustly independent. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, we've we've answered all the questions that have uh, come our way, um, and I'd like to um, remind people that our next virtual reviewer meeting, sorry, next virtual reviewer meets reviewed will happen on Thursday, sixteenth of June, twenty twenty two, four to six, and it's about Professor Maria de Demoisier's book, Burgundy: The Global Story of Terroir. And it's with reviewer, Professor Rachel E. Black. And there's a link on the chat if anyone wants to know more information. Um, now, just to wind up, I would like to say thank you to Carlos and Anthony for an extremely interesting uh, afternoon. I'd also like to thank all of our uh, questioners who posed some uh, really interesting problems in terms of the text itself and uh, some interesting side uh, views as well. Um, I'd like to thank Ted and Hanina for their work and all the people at the RAI. Um, and uh, basically, I think that's it. <laughs> um, unless uh, Carlos or Anthony want to add anything. Um i just like to thank Carlos for writing such an interesting book. I'd like to thank you, Martin, for being such a, a genial uh, mediator. Uh, I'd like to thank Hanin and Ted for all the background techno stuff that they've done. And I'd like to thank all the people who came and asked questions and posed issues and kept this going for the past couple of hours and then some. So thank you. And thank you for inviting me. I'm most flattered. Thank you. I, I, uh, for me, this was a pleasure. Yes. Uh, this was a pleasure. This was fun, uh, enlightening. Uh, as always, uh, the, the questions were uh, not only interesting, but I think invigorating. And I think uh, I, I, I've never enjoyed myself more. And I have to, I have to tell you, I'm, I was partially trained by the Manchester School crowd, mm -hmm. uh, so I know of your ilk, uh, both Martin and Anthony. <laughs> I know of your ilk, um, having had to face Victor Turner and and uh, um, Freddie Bailey and these these characters uh, at my university in California, University of California, San Diego, where they visited frequently. Uh, and Freddie, of course, became a faculty member at UCSD and, in fact, was my chair of my dissertation committee. So I've been strongly influenced by, uh, by that lot. <laughs> uh, so for me, it was, it was uh, um, uh, being in the midst of, of, of my, my colleagues and former professors uh, all of whom had this wonderfully jovial way of cutting one up. Uh, and especially Freddie Bailey, when he thought we said something stupid, uh, he would do this. And that was brain floss that we needed in order to clear up our, our, our thinking. Uh, <laughs> and that, 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 was, that was Freddie's favorite uh, response to something stupid we may have uh, uh, uttered during our seminars. Mm -hmm. So I thank you all, uh, Ted, muchas gracias, uh, Janin, muchas gracias, uh, Anthony Grant, gracias, muchas, and Martin Edwards. I hope to see yeah. all of you uh, in, I, in, on the island uh, within the next maybe year or two if things get sorted out. As a matter of fact, remember the last time we had to cancel this because my wife came down with COVID the night before. And this morning, as a matter of fact, she had to go to Mayo Clinic to check to make sure she didn't get another dose of the virus. We just got back from Mexico, so she wasn't feeling all that well. 
So even though after after three vaccinations, mm -hmm. and and also uh, uh, all sorts of genetic treatments, but. Uh, th this is where we are right now. So I thank you all. Uh, please, anything I can do for RAI, count on me. Uh, I, I'm here. Uh, if you want me to participate in any way, shape, or form, except with money, I would be happy <laughs> to do so. No, even that. Thank you. Oh, thank and you, Carlos. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that we got to run this now this year yeah. after we had to postpone it last year. That was so sad. Um, and for such a sort of terrible reason as well. And so we're very uh, happy and lucky that we're, we're going on and everybody's is good now. So thank you to uh, Anthony as well. Thank you to thank Martin you. for sharing this wonderful to have you with us. And uh, thank you to our audience uh, for staying with us, listening, posing questions coming. Uh, some of you I know now by name, you've come repeatedly. That's wonderful to see those names again. So thank you very much and have a lovely evening or rest of your day. And I'm going to close the event now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.